So at Creative Commons, we've got a fairly grandiose goal, um, universal access to research and education and full participation in culture. So the two key words there are access and participation. So we argue that um, whenever public money touches copyright works, the public should have, by default, um, not only the ability to access that work, that is not only the ability to see it, but also the ability to reuse it, um, and remix it and adapt it for their own purposes. Um, so that's our kind of grandiose goal, and it's a universal goal that's shared by 72 different Creative Commons affiliates around the world. Um, we implement this, this goal in two ways. One, we offer free licenses, and li license here just means permission, so we give free, legally robust ways to give permission for other people to use your copyright work if you're the rights holder. Um, and I'll explain it in a, in, a bit, um, in a bit more detail what these licenses mean in a second. Um, the second thing we do is um, we advocate for the use of these licenses across eight different project areas. So you can see in the top corner there, Open Glam, which is galleries, libraries, archives, museums, which is what we're going to be talking about today. But we also work in arts and culture, government, schools, um, open textbooks at university to help address some of the, the issues there, um, open access to research, which is a big problem at the moment, um, indigenous knowledge and open data. So let's start with the really, really obvious point that we all know, but just to kind of clear the ground. Um, it's becoming much easier to access New Zealand's cultural heritage, um, digital New Zealand. It's kind of hard, my, I keep quoting these figures that keep changing because they keep going up by 500,000 every time I talk about it, but they've got about 29 million, I think, digital items available through um, the Digital New Zealand portal, which is taken from 180 plus, I'm going to say it's 180 for the purposes of camera, um, 180 plus um, heritage institutions. So it's a really great resource, and it's becoming much easier to, to access this stuff. Um, and there's an obvious potential to disseminate these items um, um, across the heritage sector for reuse by the wider public. Um, one example of this is the Getty Museum, um, which, um, like many heritage institutions, used to charge for the ability to reuse its out of copyright work. So they had a lot of really high quality um, images and they used to license these to publishers um, for a fee. And they would get around 121 purchases from publishers and various other organisations per month. Um, at some point they realised that this was really going against their mission, they were a public good institution, they wanted to share this work um, for anyone to reuse, for anyone to access, anyone to download. Um, as soon as they did so, they got 60,000 downloads per month. Um, however, so there's a great potential out there for others to share and reuse heritage items. Um, the problem is that the le legal barriers to dissemination and reuse remain. Um, the primary legal barrier we're going to be talking about today is copyright. Um, so without going into the weeds um, here, um, Copyright has a few kind of attributes that make it difficult for other people to share and reuse it. Um, the first is that it's automatic. Um, second is that it applies online, no C required, and it lasts for a really, really long time, which causes all kinds of problems for heritage institutions trying to um, open up copyright works for reuse. Um, so Victoria can go into some detail about what those problems are, but they get really gnarly after a while. It can become really hard to track down rights holders after a work's been created. Um, and the, the first point there is also important um, is that copyright is more restrictive than most people realise. So I work with a lot of teachers, and teachers often assume that because they're educators and doing kind of a public good job, they can do whatever they want with copyright works, and that's not at all the case. Even though educators have slightly more rights than we do, um, the exceptions under the Act are not very great even for educators. Um, so yeah, that's an important point. Copyright is more restrictive than most people realise. Um, so what this means for the heritage sector is that usage rights statements um, that are given to the public to kind of guide them on the reuse of, of digitised works that are often vague, overly restrictive and not standardised across the sector. So it's really hard as a member of the public to know what rights you have around some of these works. Um, an example of this, um, I used to work at the Royal Society of New Zealand, so I can put this up there. Um, this is an, a record from volume 14, 1881 of the Transactions and Proceedings of the New Zealand Institute, which is what the Royal Society of New Zealand was called in the 19th century. Um, they've got a lot of really great scientific works um, this work is clearly out of copyright, so it's from 1881. The person who wrote it may, may have been born, let's say, in 1850. Um, clearly would have been died, would have died um, 50 years before. Um, so, but if you go down to using this item, you see that usage rights there, right in the middle of the screen. Um, it says the usage rights item of this item are currently unclear, please ask us for advice. So what that does, even though this item is clearly out of copyright, um, the, the institution hasn't marked it as being out of copyright, so it's kind of put the burden of determining whether or not that work is legal to use on the end user. That may be fine if it's a professional researcher, um, but if it's, as I say, a teacher or a student, they, they might be quite confused with this and they may end up not using that item um, in creative and interesting ways. So, what to do? Um, the guy from Creative Commons is obviously going to be 
advocating for some use of Creative Commons, right? Um, so what we, we advocate is starting from the other direction. So instead of starting from a position of closed and opening up a few items as you go, we argue that the default really should be open and you should be making really good arguments for works to be closed. Um, so we've got a few different recommendations. The first is clearly mark out of copyright works as such, like the item I talked about before, that's really clearly out of copyright, there's no risk involved here. Um, why not make those works, uh, mark those works rather as clearly out of copyright so the end user has some clarity. Um, second, we um, are advocating that CC licensing for works um, with CC friendly donors. So if someone's giving you stuff and that person is friendly towards Creative Commons or doesn't have any objections to the use of Creative Commons, um, let's try and ensure that those works are CC licensed from the get-go so you don't have all kinds of problems 50, 70, 100 years down the track. Um, so the way to do this is add CC um, option to, to the deposit agreements, or the donor agreements. Um, an example of this is from Upper Hutt City Library, um, from photographer Ravel Jackson, who's I think about 97, but he deposited about 30,000 really high quality images of um, Upper Hutt events from like 1960 to 1990. So works that would be um, under copyright, um, but he was kind of um, thought that the public should be able to um, share and reuse these works without the library or himself putting any additional barriers on. So he agreed for the works to be licensed under a, a CC by non-commercial license, which I'll explain in a second what that means. Um, but the kind of upshot of that is that if you're interested in Upper Hutt history, you've got this really, really great quality resource that's publicly available for free without any price or technical restrictions and a very minimal legal restriction for attribution and commercial reuse. And the third thing we recommend is that works for which the institution holds copyright, they should be CC licensed in advance. A lot of our heritage institutions are publicly funded, therefore the works, the copyright works produced by those institutions should be CC licensed, again by default. There might be a good reason why some of those works shouldn't be, but by default we say um, CC licensing should be used. So, I've talked a wee bit about the recommendations for Creative Commons licensing, but I haven't actually told you what Creative Commons licensing is, so let's do that before I finish up. Um, so the pitch for using CC licensing is that they're clear, simple, free, legally robust, and they let you keep your copyright. Um, so you're not giving away your copyright when you use a CC license. You're licensing away certain rights um, for other people. Um, so if you imagine the public domain on the one hand, and all rights reserved copyright on the other, we kind of give you a range of options in the middle. So it's not just an on or off switch. It's a range of kind of, we can, you can do this, but you can't do that. Um, now, if you want to learn, or you want to know what Creative Commons um, is, there's kind of four basic license elements, and this is kind of the most important stuff you to know. The first is attribution, so all Creative Commons licenses require um, the end user to give credit to the original creator or the original rights holder. Um, the second is non-commercial, and this means that the primary purpose of someone reusing your work can't be for private monetary compensation. And this definition turns on the use of the work and not the user, so um, a non-commercial institution could use a work commercially, and vice versa, if that makes sense. Um, no derivatives means that you can't um, adapt or change that work outside of the, um, the rights you have under the Copyright Act. And the final one is um, share-alike, and this means that if anyone does adapt your work, say they, make, they take a bit of work A and make work B, work B has to have the same license as work A, and so on down the road, work C has to have the same license as work B, so it kind of ensures that anyone who reuses your work also has to use Creative Commons licensing. And that gives us six licenses, running from more free to more restrictive. Um, for public institutions, we, and also, the, um, as, as Keith is going to talk about, the government itself recommends the most liberal license, which is Creative Commons attribution. Now, a lot of institutions and a lot of um, individuals tend to start at the more restrictive end, and as they realise that, um, as they realise the benefits of open licensing, they tend to kind of march their way back to the more liberal end. Um, and happily, the licenses come in um, three layers. So there's a human readable version for, for the humans, um, and there's a lawyer readable version for the lawyers. Um, the lawyer readable version is a wee bit longer. Um, I've been told it's, it's still readable. I've read it, 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 is, it is readable, but um, the human readable layer will give you all the, all the basic information you need to know. Um, we also have a bunch of resources available um, online at resources.creativecommons.org.nz, um, including um, from the most simple, such as brochures, to a bit more complicated stuff like um, a bit more detailed papers and, and videos and that kind of thing. Great, so that's me. Um, feel free to get in touch with me on that, that very complicated contact screen. Um, but otherwise, I'll pass it on to Keith. Good morning, everyone. 
as, as Victoria said, I'm um, directly of the Government Data and Information Programme. I'm based at Land Information New Zealand. Um, it seems a strange place for us to be, so I always explain so that you don't ask this question later. Um, the CEO of LIMS chairs our governance group, and so he generously um, hosts and supports our programme. Uh, just going back to the beginning, um, Lawrence Lessig who was one of the eminent lawyers who devised the Creative Commons suite of licences, he's been very direct about the importance of, of licensing content for legal reuse. So as, as Matt's explained, there's the, we assert copyright, but as well as that, we must assert what licence allows legal reuse of it. And he has said that we're creating a generation of criminals who download online content illegally because copyright law has not kept up with the technology. And I'm sure all of us can't put our hand on our heart and say we haven't downloaded something illegally from the internet. So this is where NZ Gold comes in. Now it's license, it's a framework to help government agencies to assign a license to their copyright works. So government guidance to follow when releasing copyright works and non-copyright material for reuse. Now it was approved back in 2010 by Cabinet and it adopts the Creative Commons suite of licences. And a reason that Matt didn't explain, um, which was very important for us, was that they're free. We haven't had to pay to use these licences. You don't have to pay to use these licences. They're kept up to date for these um, 70 odd countries to use them internationally. And it's meant that different organisations don't end up with different types of contracts that their lawyers have devised for their particular institution, which may mean they can't, people, users can't reuse that material well because there's different um, contracts that they have to follow. So Cabinet approved it and had high expectations that the reuse of copyright works and non-copyright materials that are held across government would help was major in many, many ways. So there'd be creative works that, new creative works that people would create. There'd be better opportunities for people to make decisions about their own lives through being, having access to material. Now this of course is much wider than the, the, the GLAM sector. It's all government held information that's non-personal and unrestricted. There'd be opportunities for businesses to create new tools, products, new, new business new revenue back to government in the form of taxation. And better opportunities for uh, sustaining the environment through better information about it. And on the, on the sort of civil side, better opportunity for um, working with government to write better policy and to engage democratically. And of course government agencies themselves will be more efficient when they use their own material rather than creating it again. So that's the really high level expectations for NZ Goal and also a couple of other policies that were approved at the same time, which I'll just refer to at the very end. So Cabinet gave it a wide mandate. Government departments were directed to familiarise themselves, themselves with the um, framework and apply it when releasing their copyright works and their non copyright materials for reuse. So examples there are the Ministry for Cultural Heritage, National Library, Archives and under the DIA um, uh, responsibility and of course all other government departments. The, the rest of the state services were encouraged and that's where Crown entities such as Te Papa and Heritage New Zealand come in. You're not directed to familiarise yourself with it and apply it to your copyright works, non-copyright materials, but you are encouraged to do so. And then um, local government's been invited and they've had a couple of letters, um, most recently in December, inviting them to, to join the programme. So that covers then museums and art galleries that are under local government responsibility. So what does it mean in a, in a um, department? We've essentially um, cut our teeth on working with the central government who've been directed to um, um, become familiar with the, with the framework. And what we have now across all of government is a, is a data champion at, at the senior level in, in every department. 
and that person's role is to lead the adoption of the declaration in their, in their agency and make sure that that um, releasing of material for legal reuse is included in strategic and business plans like SOE, SOIs and um, business plans within, within an um, agency like Te Papa. And that also means that there needs to be a coordinator who's, who's um, doing that work for that, for that agency champion and that person connects with the business groups who are releasing the content or managing the content. And that could be website people, publication staff, people who are writing the privacy copyright statements on their websites and um, people who are publishing the offline material. So we, we're expecting to have a statement about the license on both online and off offline material. And so a typical, a typical policy for your institution, just adding to what Matt's already said, include NZ Gold in your donor agreement, so ensure that you and the donor agree on the property rights for that, and your recommendation is that you ensure that that material can be made uh, available for legal reuse. When you're um, getting, bringing in new materials, license them for reuse in accordance with NZ Gold. Uh, develop a process when you're doing your, your retrospective work for working with the existing copyright owners and get their permission for legal reuse. Victoria asked talking to someone the other day who had a call from you about a work here. <laughs> she was asking me what I did and I explained it well enough for her to say, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about and I've just said yes to Victoria Leachman. <laughs> so that was cool. And then where you've got all your orphan works, draw up a policy and a procedure for how you work through those. And in that case, you may end up with a non-known non rights statement. So that moves to the licenses. The government has approved the default <coughs> license, the CC BY, and essentially it says if it's a copyright work, you're licensed to um, <coughs> um, reuse it. You then, the owner of the, of the, of the item, assign a CC BY license, but before you do that, look at the, and there's a list of restrictions in NZ Gold, look at those and see whether there is a reason for needing to restrict it in your organisation. And also for copyright materials, go through a similar process and, and put a no no right statement on the material. Now, the eagle-eyed people there will notice that I've noted the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 license. NZ Goal was re um, version 2 was released last week, 20th of April, and that has moved um, our, our recommendation from the CC3 licenses to the new CC4 licenses. Now, don't panic if you have heaps of work in your organisation that's licensed under a CC3 licence, it's perfectly fine. You don't need to do any retrospective work. But in the future, we're recommending you, you use the CC 4.0 international licence. So, more information about all of this is up on ict.gov.nz. That gives you details about those different licences, if that's something that's of interest to you. That one of the most important changes <coughs> is that it's easier to, to attribute the um, for users to attribute the copyright um, license. And if you want to talk to me about any further training, we offer training on Easy Goal. You can see my details there. And of course, there's lots of conversations on Twitter. If you want to do contribute to a Twitter conversation, there's a hashtag um, hashtag Open Data. Thank you. Um, welcome everyone to the Creative Commons Aotearoa New Zealand Glam Road Trip 2015 to Papa Session. So Papa uses works by others that have Creative Commons licences. Uh, one of my training sessions for staff here is to show them how to use an advanced search in Flickr to find Creative Commons licensed images such as this one. Uh, just like anyone else, staff want to reuse um, images they found on the internet and I've always tried to make sure that Tababa staff reuse only those images where they have the correct permissions to do so. Creative Commons licensing really helps us with that. Um, staff are always on the hunt for good quality free images and some Creative Commons licenses allow for open reuse which is really helpful for us. But it's not just images sourced from other people. Tababa also uses other types of Creative Commons licensed content. Uh, 
I personally think one of the more interesting developments is how we're starting to use platforms that encourage Creative Commons licensing when we're developing exhibitions in partnership with particular sections of the society. The recent declassified exhibition features work of the Tapapa's natural history um, scientists. The online part of the exhibition encourages the public to lodge images of spiders and ferns into the Nature Watch New Zealand website or phone app for Te Papa staff to identify. If the contributor licenses the images image with um, a Creative Commons license, the image is up for selection to appear in the exhibition. There's an iPad that gets updated with new images regularly. We initially dipped our toe into Creative Commons licensing with our own content in 2008. We developed podcasts for the Rhett Angus Life and Vision exhibition. Now the whole point of podcasts is obviously so that people download and play them, and we wanted to encourage people to do so, but uh, the Creative Commons licensing had an unanticipated benefit for us uh, when we were touring the exhibition. Other venues wanted to reuse these podcasts for their own events and on their own websites, and we didn't have to go and, uh, and I didn't have to spend time drawing up a license to allow them to do so. I could just point them in the direction of the website and say, hey, they're there, the Creative Commons license, go for it, download and use them. We've also released some text documents with Creative Commons licenses, um, particularly those documents we want people to share and reuse. National Services to Pairangi are adding Creative Commons licensing to resource guides as they roll them out to, um, with each new edition. The new edition allows the team to check any licensing of third party material and make sure that it's completed on the understanding that the resource will be Creative Commons licensed. And here of course is my opportunity to plug National Services new edition of the copyright resource guide and it's downloadable as a PDF from the National Services section of the public website. But if you're into counting numbers, uh, the project with the most use of Creative Commons licensing is our download project. This project updated Tapapa's website to provide <coughs> images of Tapapa's collections for free download at the highest resolution we hold. Now obviously Tapapa could only provide these, this for those images that were out of copyright or where Tapapa was the sole rights holder. There are donor restrictions, cultural rights and privacy rights to accommodate as well. And so we ended up with three different rights statements. Um, they do remind me of a traffic light, so just want to put the image up. Um, the All Rights Reserved covers those items where the third party rights are still existing. These include works that are in copyright, or are orphaned works, or are still to be assessed with donor restrictions, cultural restrictions, or with privacy concerns. Te Papa grants a Creative Commons licence where Te Papa is the sole rights holder of the digital surrogate, either because the copyright in the work pictured is owned solely by Te Papa, or where the digital surrogate has enough creativity to create a new copyright and Te Papa is the copyright holder. Where the digital surrogate is an exact copy of the collection item, Te Papa believes these aren't eligible for copyright, and because these images are out of copyright, Creative Commons licences can't be used. So we release these with a no known copyright restriction statement as recommended by the New Zealand Government Open Licensing Framework, as Kate mentioned. Um, I just want to say, for those of you familiar with copyright and openness, only those images marked up with no known copyright restrictions statement are open and that they can be reused and remixed for any purpose whatsoever, including commercial use. Um, the Creative Commons license we picked is the most restrictive of the Creative Commons license suite. It's a license that allows copying and reuse, but only if the use is non-commercial and only if the work is copied and not altered. Uh, the reason we picked the non-commercial restriction is that Tapapa still has an active sales and licensing um, team to service commercial requests for images and footage. You can still download the Creative Commons licensed images at high resolution, but the media sales and licensing team stands ready to provide licenses for any commercial use that you might be anticipating. Um, the markup with right status is happening as part of my workflow. This is a, a slide indicating where I've got to so far. Um, this is a breakdown of the half a million catalogue records we have online. Um, this, rec this records the collection items, not the images themselves. Uh, the read section is all rights reserved, but I just want to note that also includes a backlog requiring all rights assessment by me. Um, the images are getting released as I get a chance to assess them and mark them up with the correct rights statements. The amber section are the records uh, marked up with Creative Commons licensing, and there's just over 20,000 of those at the moment. 
And the green sections are the records marked up with no known copyright restrictions. The dark green are the images available and the light section are those that still require photography. There's 56,000 in total and 30,000 with images. Uh, Topopera releases the highest quality JPEG available. Uh, this is technically what we can achieve right now. Um, in some cases, some of the works haven't been digitised since the early 2000s, um, so the resolution isn't as high as we would like. Um, but if a user needs something re-photographed, then we direct them towards the media sales and licensing team to arrange it, and fees may apply. So, downloads, what's happening? Um, it's not surprising that 75% of the downloads that, we're, we're, that, are, that are happening are for the no known copyright restricted material, as this is mostly our art and our photography collections. We also ask people to tell us why they're downloading material, um, downloading our images. We get around a 25% response rate for that, and they tell us all sorts of uses, um, some of which were expected and some of which weren't. This type of use is fairly expected. We've been told images are being used by create um, by educators and by students. Uses like this blog, but also in scholarly papers and coursework. Um, we've had one from an online study guide, children's art classes, evening classes, and also for individual learning. Um, images have been used to create other works, including in collages and fabric designs, as a prompt for fiction writing, which was a new one for me, um, and in the digital artworks. Note that the images used here are mainly the no known copyright restricted images, as using the Creative Commons license material that we hold to create derivative works is not permitted currently under the license we use. Um, that, that restriction's actually made us rethink our Creative Commons licensing because we want to encourage more creativity in the making of art. So we're looking at removing the no derivatives part of the um, license in the future, hopefully next one, each year. The no known copyright restriction images has, have been used commercially, um, including on greeting cards, book covers, jewellery and also within books. We haven't come across a use where Creative Commons licensed images have been used commercially in breach of our license. Um, we've had other instances where people commercial reuse has been um, licensed by the media sales and licensing department, so you know, that fl workflow is going well. People have done the right thing and asked for a license for their reuse. With commercial use. Another type of use that been downloaded for personal use, tattoo designs, wasn't anticipating that one, printing on a t-shirt, themed dinner invitations and as avatar images. Um, I've, had, I've seen comments like sharing image on Facebook with a friend that likes penguins. So, great, good one, cool. We can tell that about 10% of our downloads are actually by Tupapa staff. Um, this image was downloaded in preference to our internal systems because Collections Online has clearer rights statements and it's currently the easiest way to get hold of good quality um, images fast. Um, it's telling us the institution is saving, what we've done is saving us money because it's, we've developed a tool that's useful for staff and allows them to do what they want to do quickly. Um, they've been using the images in all parts of their work including to up an intranet, to up exhibitions, Twitter page, Facebook, digital channel, a whole stack of different users. And they've been downloaded and used by staff from other GLAM institutions. This one was obviously being used as um, gentle encouragement for more openness in the sector. We've had a much bigger in, um, uptake that we've in, than we anticipated. We estimated around 500 downloads per month and we got 7,500 in the first five months. So we've been really pleased with how it's going. Um, in working towards the reuse of images and data from our collection, we've wrestled with the same concerns that probably every um, gallery, library, archive and museum institution seems to worry about. Here's the list. And I don't think anything on this list will be a surprise to anyone working in this sector. So here's what we did. Of the six concerns here, we've solved a few, and we're still working through a few as well. Concerns have, the concerns we hold haven't stopped us releasing images, just the release of those particular images where the concern um, exists. An example of this for us are our Taonga Māori collections. With the Y262 Waitangi Tribunal case still to be responded to by the Crown, 
Te Papa still needs to think through how it's going to handle reuse of images of Taonga Māori and images of Tupuna. So those collection items are currently not included in our download project and remain under the All Rights Reserve Statement. Um, as I said, the integrity of the work, the derogatory use concern is interesting. Um, this influenced us to pick, it, pick the no derivatives licence, um, but we're starting to understand that the digital surrogate of a work isn't the work itself, isn't the original work. We're also recognising that the no derivatives is currently preventing people from remixing our Creative Commons licensed works, and now we're looking at removing the no derivatives off the licence to allow derivative works to be created. Um, Tupap is realising from the actions of other institutions such as the Reich Museum that the benefits of communities engaging with collections on, in this way and remixing far outweigh the, the fear of derogatory use. But the final concern also remains. Uh, at this time Tupap has decided that it wishes to continue with its still and moving image sales and licensing business. That business has certain revenue targets it's expected to meet. Um, when the download project was considered, it was obvious there was going to be an impact on the revenue generation for that business. This related to the release of the no known copyright restrictions images. Um, this impact was quantified, the business plan was adjusted, and uh, we, used, we selected the non-commercial Creative Commons license element for, for those images, where Tapapa was the sole rights holder. And at this stage we're not looking at changing that. Te Papa is trying to achieve a greater and deeper audience engagement with its collection and one of the ways we're doing this is, is, is doing this download project. If we want more use of our collections we need to offer people what they want in an easy way to get it. Um, we've worked really hard to make the copyright status easily understood. We've used symbols that Creative Commons uses and put plain English text next to them. We understand that not everybody gets Creative Commons licensing quite yet. So we're walking people through the frequent up, ask questions up front, and we've provided the attribution so it's a quick copy and paste to make it easy for people. And we did this with the no known copyright restrictions page as well, again using commonly used buttons and plain English. <coughs> Creative Commons licensing allows to Papa to reserve the rights that we want to administer, the commercialisation of our photography, but whilst also allowing reuse for those types of non-commercial activities we want to encourage, knowledge transfer, personal reuse of images, of natural environment, cultural and heritage collection items from our collection. Um, I've got to say there's absolutely no finish line with this uh, project. Uh, we've still got collections arriving, we're still documenting collections we've had for a while, we're still digitising and photographing, I'm still doing rights assessment and rights research, and copyright terms are expiring every year. So we're also thinking about next steps. Um, as far as our users are concerned, we need to do more to communicate the availability of this resource to our target audiences. We need to go where they are. And we're also planning on releasing, well we have released collections data um, starting to under Creative Commons by licence and minimising attribution as um, recommended by the New Zealand Government Open Licensing Framework. We're also trialling the release of our first set of scientific data, but that's in progress and it's not released quite yet. We want to get a better understanding of where, what and why reuse and remix is happening with our collection images, so we need to analyse our data. Longer term, I'd also like to look at what we can do to educate donors about Creative Commons licensing. Creative Commons has helped out by developing an information sheet for donors, and it's something we're looking at adding into our process. Um, I know Te Papa will have succeeded when I see artists and creators legally using images of Te Papa's collection items to make something like this. Um, without any involvement from Te Papa. This work was created for inclusion in the space in the Ngātori Arts Te Papa exhibition. I had to provide a licence to the artist to allow her to create a derivative work using Creative Commons licensed images from our collection, and I'm hoping I won't have to next time around. Thank you. I'm here to talk from the perspective of the Turnbull Library at the National Library of New Zealand about a piece of policy work um, that provides the context content and sort of some implementation stuff around what we're doing for um, a new reuse policy, relatively new re reuse policy that um, we released about 18 months ago that provides a path forward through the seemingly ambiguous noise of um, uh, collection reuse. Um, so 
Um, from our perspective, uh, use and reuse of archival collections is a contested issue. There's a range of cultural, social and legislative frameworks which sometimes bring conflicting expectations to debates about what libraries, archives, museums should or shouldn't allow to happen to the collections that they manage. The policy that we have developed comprises an overarching suite of principles that support consistency and transparency in all of our decisions um, about reuse throughout the National Library system, from engagement with donors and publishers through the management of the collection items right through to um, putting more collections intellectually and financially freely available under no known copyright restriction for those items that are out of copyright. So it's quite broad in scope, the policy. Um, I'll be focusing on a few specific sort of aspects of it for this, for this talk. Um, so there's quite strong voices in the sector that encourage fully open and reusable collections available um, kind of like promoting the utopia of open access to all knowledge. Um, just to sort of briefly talk about them, there's, I'm going to walk around, does the camera follow me? Um, there's, uh, there's an open culture movement. Um, we have people like Matt at Creative Commons coming to institutions like this saying, use more Creative Commons licenses, make your collections more freely available. We have sort of content aggregators, both in New Zealand and uh, uh, and internationally, who are also promoting the sort of open culture movement. Um, uh, NZ Go in New Zealand, we have the government saying to us as a central government agency, um, make your collections more open, make your data more open, use Creative Commons licensing. Um, we have international um, sort of collegial institutions, the Rikes Museum and the British Library, releasing quite a significant number of items um, available. Um, under a sort of free and open license. We have our colleagues at uh, Te Papa also doing the same thing. So um, we kind of have the sort of societal and sector and government sort of um, pressure, I guess, or sort of advocacy coming to institutions like us um, and like many institutions around New Zealand um, to say, open your collections, open your collections, open your collections. But at the same time, this is kind of the best slide I could come up with to um, represent a sort of alternate view. So the rights relating to items online are still quite complicated. Um, and in my view, society is still figuring out where it stands in some aspects of, um, of open licensing. So like most collecting institutions, a lot of our collections are about people. Um, many photographic collections, which are the ones that are really in high demand for um, for being openly licensed and available online. Um, many photographic collections uh, relate to Māori or Pacific people and are of eth ethnographic in nature. Their meaning is derived from the context of their creation and the relationship between the creator and the subjects. This means that even when items are out of copyright, how the, collection, how the collecting institution manages them and what it allows others to do with them can have a significant effect on how communities respect that institution. So, as Matt said, sort of being clear about marking items um, um, with uh, statements about what you can or can't do with them is one of the things that sort of helps, um, um, uh, helps mitigate that risk. But these range of cultural, economic and social perspectives can be applied to the use of collections can be challenging to resolve in a, in a conflicting way. I've been reading the um, summary information of the Y262 claim uh, recently, um, and there's a couple of things in there that I think are worth repeating. One is um, uh, the, that Māori have a responsibility to provide guardianship for their cultural heritage, and for a range of reasons this responsibility is shared with the Crown. And also the, uh, the Treaty of Waitangi Tribunal claim also um, reinforced that the current legal frameworks um, for providing um, guardianship of uh, Tāma Māori are not appropriate for, um, for providing uh, guardianship for um, Tāma Māori. So we kind of as an institution are sort of um, in the middle of these perspectives. There's an open culture movement but also there's some concern about what we uh, should or shouldn't be doing with our collections or letting people do with our collections. Now some of the 
relate to some of the issues that Victoria put up before. So sitting in the middle of this kind of um, tension is the sort of ambiguous concept of trust. It's the one single crucial concept that collecting institutions rely on in order to build collections. The vast majority of archival collections at the Alexander Turnbull Library are built through a donations process. People, organizations, family, iwi, fauna, and often marginalized communities um, have to trust the library if it's going to hand the items over and make them part of the uh, nation's memory. So not being clear about reuse creates two significant risks around this sort of trust relationship. One is that users see it as a barrier, and so the items are not used at all. Um, items aren't used, the open culture movement, and people who want to freely sort of reuse, reuse items um, see it as a barrier, and so um, uh, the collection items are just not used. And that sort of defeats the purposes of the library. Um, but also, um, the other risk is that they just get used anyway. It creates such a confusing sort of set of statements that people go, oh, I don't know, let's just do it. Let's just do it. I can't get my head around this, I'll just use it. And all of a sudden items become um, reused online in contexts that may or may not be appropriate. So without this sort of clear statements, um, there's a couple of risks there. And the library or the collecting institution can find itself in the middle of that goes back to that trust relationship. One of the biggest uh, creators to some of the ambiguity, ambiguity in our own um, institution is our own past activities. Um, this is not to knock the endeavours of my colleagues from uh, current and past, but um, what is past is prologue after all. Um, but it's fair to say that our library's approach to addressing reuse has previously been piecemeal, ad hoc, responsive to limited context and not systematic. Um, and kind of part of the reason why we needed to take a policy approach to do this. This is an example that I use to uh, reinforce this point. This is the same collection item. The source system is Tapui at the Alexander Turnbull Library. It's a bit blurry, I'm sorry, I should have sharpened these up. Um, essentially circled there is a, um, uh, a restrictions field, and the restriction says um, partially restricted um, items not suitable for viewing, but surrogate copies will be provided. So it doesn't tell you anything about reuse. Um, on the National Library uh, website, so the item gets aggregated up to the National Library website, um, there's a statement there which is the template, the boilerplate statement, and it kind of says, yeah, but nah. Yeah, you can kind of use it sometimes, but nah, don't. <laughs> and and um, it's really quite a confusing statement. Um, that gets aggregated up to Digital New Zealand and under usage there it just says unknown and there's a question mark because they haven't been able to figure out what our metadata tells us about what people can and can't do with things. But wait, there's more. About five or six or seven years ago we actually put a whole lot of items up on Flickr under no known copyright restriction of which this was one of them. So the same item is four different use statements on four different channels. So We've kind of really confused ourselves as well as um, as as well as uh, our researchers, um, and I, I guess that kind of reflects the different perspectives that have been brought to bear on what uh, the library should or shouldn't let happen to its collections. Those kind of tensions that I talked about in society, they kind of they they're reflected within the library, and sometimes things get um, put out openly by a flicker, and sometimes they're more restricted. So. We haven't been so systematic in our approach in the past. Um, this provided the need for a, a policy work. I started working at the library about two and a half, three years ago. I said, what's your position on this? And then I got 20 <laughs> different answers. Um, so I endeavoured to draft a policy. Um, this is a snapshot of the uh, resource page, one of the resource pages of the Creative Commons Aotearoa website. The policy has now been genericized, for lack of a better word and is now available for you to use if you want to use it in your collection as well. Um, uh, it's a suite of nine principles that are about the collections and one statement about our metadata, which is that um, following BMZ goal recommendations that our metadata will be made available under CC BY. 
kind of slip that one past the goalie, as that was sort of, we were all talking about what was happening with our collections, there's a little metadata one um, snuck through as well. But the principles, um, as I said before, they cover the sort of entire sort of system of the library. These are the ones that relate to the supply side, so the conversations we have with our donors and publishers. Essentially, principle one, we'll do stuff that's legal. Principle three is important. The National Library will adhere to the terms, conditions, or restrictions for use and reuses as agreed um, at the time the items are acquired. So that's a really, um, really strong message to donors that whatever we agree with donors and publishers, we will adhere to that. So we're not going to compromise that trust relationship in any way. But we've also said, principle four, um, that in terms of new stuff coming through, negotiations with rights owners and donors will promote and be informed by the Creative Commons licensing framework to, as a mechanism to facilitate use and reuse for in copyright works. And down here is just us saying NZ Goal will be applied um, where the National Library is the um, copyright owner. So it's sort of reinforcing our, uh, what's already been told to us that we must do anyway, but it's incorporating within the system that's where NZ Goal is really critical to us as well, even though the rest of it is kind of following the vibe of, of NZ Goal. On this sort of demand side, so pushing items out, um, Principle two, collections will be delivered to researchers with clear and consistent statements on use and reuse. Um, clearly, given the example that I said before, uh, that I showed before, it's an aspirational policy. It's not a, it's an aspirational principle. It's not a current state at all. But it's a really important thing for us to um, bring to bear to all the conversations that we have every time we talk about what's going to happen to these collection items. Clear and consistent statements. Clear and consistent statements. Clear and consistent statements. Um, and this is the other one I'm just going to talk about from now on, um, or just reinforce now. Where no known copyright, where no copyright restriction applies, the library will seek to provide items for use and reuse with a statement of no known copyright restriction, comma, after careful consideration of cultural and ethical issues. So that's us saying. We've got a place we want to be, we want to push as much stuff out as possible, but we still want the right to be able to say, we're a little bit uncomfortable um, uh, with putting that out for anybody to do whatever they want with, because there's, um, there's Tanga Māori or these other sort of cultural considerations or other ethical considerations for us. So what are we doing about it? Um, just really briefly on that supply side, we had a, um, a donation review, a review of our donation process. We've drafted a new um, donor agreement, or a deed of gift, as, it, as it's going to be called. It's incorporating some tick boxes for Creative Commons licensing if people choose to do that. Um, so that right at the supply side, we haven't quite finalized that yet, it's with the lawyers. But from the supply side, we're looking to sort of make the rights clear right from the start. Um, we also worked with um, Matt and the Creative Commons team around um, that guideline for um, license, Creative Commons licensing for donors and depositors to cultural heritage institutions. And that's just designed to help and support the um, good conversations to be had with donors. Um, conversations with donors are complicated, they are often emotional if people are giving um, over their sort of family items. Um, so this is sort of using, using uh, a clear deed of gift and um, a, a clear guideline will just help facilitate those conversations. Um, this is a process, um, but it's the process for putting collection items out and has no known copyright restriction. It looks complicated, but it's not, because each step is just a minor step. There's a couple of really important ones in there, though. Uh, we are doing this at collection at a time. We're taking whole collections and saying, should we, it's out of copyright, should we put this as a no known copyright restriction collection? Um, usually we're saying yes. There's a couple of times we've um, been a little bit unsure. But it's just a process for figuring out how to do that, how to, how to work through that ambiguity of, of how to make a collection item open. Um, this is an early decision about copyright. Is it out of copyright? Yes. 
we have a range of curators and specialists who make recommendations about which collections um, should go through this process. But mostly already digitized, so there's been a sort of a, um, a decision-making process already. Um, we um, meet with our um, Māori specialists within the library. We have a group of staff um, who specialise in um, 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 Māori issues relating to the collections. We talk with them about highlighting any particular cultural issues as per the principle. Um, and then uh, we work our way through them, if there are some, and a couple of times we've, we've taken one or two single items out. And at the same time we're developing the criteria, or reinforcing the criteria um, around um, what, are, what those cultural issues are and what things we should just be a little bit more protective of. And then we get approval by the Chief Librarian. I tend to write up quite an extensive memo. It uh, gets approved by the Chief Librarian, or it doesn't, and we just go through and fix a couple of things up. That's a process map. It's actually really, really helpful for the library to have just a clear and consistent process to go through to push collections out under no known copyright restriction. And finally, um, on that sort of note of um, uh, the sort of uh, wanting to be a little bit, wanting to be careful of uh, Tonga Māori, uh, we are um, working with Creative Commons and a range of people who um, are looking to develop an indigenous knowledge notice. Um, it's not a license, um, but it's um, some way that the sector can provide some consistent language about um, being respectful um, and being careful in, um, about how Tonga Māori is being used. Um, we're not quite sure what that will look like yet, but it will involve quite a lot of consultation. So, um, Watch out. This is just a note to say watch out for that, be aware of the um, conversations and, and, and take part and participate in them because I think that um, um, through appropriate sort of partnership we can get this right in New Zealand. That's me, thank you very much. And that's us. Does anybody have any questions? It's not just me standing up in front of the camera for Christians, I think. Uh... Any questions for me Recently I just published a book and just getting a, um, an image from the museum and it was even related. The most difficult part is actually you had to go to the iwi to get it clear. So that clearance of going to the iwi needs to be sorted. There needs to be people within the building that actually has those contacts. It's not directly the author that has to go and do that. And so that's what was so difficult to get an image from the collection. The difficulty with that one is that um, the reason we, the reason to Papa makes people talk about that directly is that we don't necessarily feel we're the best advocates for the projects that the people approaching us about. So um, yes, I understand that there's, there's certainly a significant amount of extra investment and work you have to do when you're when you're developing a product such as a book or or exhibition or whatever, but it's to pop is not really resourced A to, to do that work on behalf of the person with the project. And second of all, they're um, they don't, they're not necessarily the best people to talk about, you know, individual projects when we have questions about how that image is particularly being used. I think sometimes e we do want to have direct contact with mm. the person. Yeah. yeah. We found that. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I guess the role of the institution there also is to be clear about who and how mm. to, to make those contacts. You know, who to go to, um, an, an email address, a phone number, a name of one or two or three or four people uh, to, contact, to contact. And I think that through this process, those sort of, um, those processes will come clear. So through the, you know, us working with Papa and sort of being relatively consistent in our approach, even though you've gone and just done the work and we've put a policy in yes, place and then yeah. are doing the work. Um, I think if we're consistent across the sector about how we make that happen, that will help researchers. Mm. Um, I'd say the library at the moment, we just kind of push, we just say, you know, we, we push that responsibility off and we don't really provide that clear, that much clear information about 
what to do next. So I think there'll be a bit of work to make that happen as well. And I agree with, with Barbara's point. We, there are some EWI that tell us they do want to be contacted, they want to be the conduits um, for that, that permissions process. Yeah, and that's that kind of the, the library's in the middle here, you know, and um, we do have responsibilities um, under the treaty um, to work in partnership, and that's kind of how that partnership's manifesting. And in terms of our, our, um, our Māori collection and our images of Tupu and Tonga, we're still, I mean, we're still working that out. We're your further along than we are in terms of process. Um, you know, we've still got work to do. We'll be focusing on the easy stuff. Uh, if I can just add something about the um, things you've gone for, they're not open access and licensing framework. I skimmed through it. It's based on policy principles as well, which have been picked up by, by other institutions. And with respect to, to um, our and Indigenous information, there's, that's uh, listed as two of the potential reasons for restricting um, the use of so you're really picking up on that and taking that mm. to the next stages. Mm. So thank you. Mm. Okay, well thank you very much for coming.